Hi, everybody. Peter, are we live? We're good. Okay, I gotta. Um, okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome. This is the Portland City Council. We're meeting in a workshop. Uh, we've got seven out of nine of us here present. I believe we'll be joined by our other two colleagues um, in person uh, shortly. Um, so uh, I'm gonna call this workshop to order. Uh, we do have some attendees with us on Zoom. So thank you for being here. I'll keep my eye out um, because we will be taking public comment tonight. So I've welcomed, I've called to order and here we are. Oh, great, Council Rodriguez is here. Um, Council Fournier's on her way. So, um, uh, so, so we'll just get right into it. I just wanted to take a couple of minutes um, before we have a presentation from our Corporation Council just to kind of lay out where we are. Um, so we um, talked a little bit about uh, Chapter 9 back at our goal setting workshop in December. Didn't get much traction. Fine, moving on. Um, followed up in response to a couple people reaching out and say, saying, where did we land on that? Didn't get much response. Okay, fine. <laughs> then February came and I got a few people reaching out saying, what about chapter nine? So we scheduled a chapter nine review in workshop on March 27th. And the intent of that workshop really was to give the council the opportunity to have a discussion on the heels of a few years worth of constituent feedback and input, um, as well as staff uh, discussion about how chapter nine governs the citizen initiative process. And at that time, in preparation for that workshop, I had asked corporation council over email, shared it with you all, that the three things that I thought we had heard most consistently from constituents was, is 1500 the right number of signatures? Is a five-year wait on uh, a council amendment to a citizen approved uh, ordinance um, the right amount of time? And do we need to have a fiscal note that would be required of any um, possible question that would go before voters. So that was the starting point on September 27th. The memo and um, uh, draft ordinance amendments on March 27th reflected uh, those three areas. Um, we met, we had some discussion, we got some feedback, we took public comment that evening, just like we will tonight. And Corporation Council has put before us um, uh, an amended version of both a memo and the ordinance with some changes that reflect the conversation that we had on March 27th. Um, so thanks to all who have given feedback, um, both at that workshop and um, between then and now. Um, I hope everybody had a chance to read um, the memo and the changes provided for us for consideration by um, our Corporation Council, Michael Goldman. Um, and Again, my intent here is to give the council the opportunity to have um, a say on whether or not putting something in front of the voters is the right move. Um, so that's that's the intention tonight is to emerge with something that we can put before the council for consideration. Um, so please give your input tonight, um, and uh, and and we'll we'll take that forward. Um, so I'll stop there and hand it over to Corporation Council for any additional uh, summary. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening, members of the council. And I'm not sure how many people we have on Zoom, but um, I think what I'll do is I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read my whole memo, but I'm I'm gonna assume that some people have not had a chance to look at it, and I'll do a quick summary of it's a the memo is essentially a summary of the changes that um, that we've made to Chapter Nine, um, and so I'll just go through that real quick. Um, the, uh, the first change is, um, as the mayor, uh, mentioned, um, is an increase in the number of, um, signatures, the, the petition signature requirement, increasing that from 1500, uh, registered voters to 10% of the number of votes cast in the previous, um, gubernatorial election. Um, the next, uh, major change um, is some changes to the procedures for 
the filing of the application in order to um, in order to have the clerk's office generate uh, a petition, um, and also uh, a review process um, whereby the clerk, in um, in consultation with our office, um, would make sure that uh, that the um, that the proposed ordinance meets certain requirements in the uh, in the chapter. Um, the next change is some changes to section 936 and 937, um, clarifying petitioner requirement, uh, I'm sorry, cir uh, circulator requirements. Um, and, uh, and also including some, uh, some um, uh, certifications that circulators will have to make when they submit uh, pe assigned petitions. Um, we're also proposing adding a fiscal impact statement. So upon the city's receipt of a um, of an application for a citizen initiative, um, we would have the finance director uh, or the finance uh, office prepare a, um, a fiscal impact statement. Um, and also um, we're considering a, an additional requirement that if the fiscal impact is greater than 50,000, then the uh, then the ordinance would have a prospective application date that would start at the beginning of the next fiscal year, um, rather than have it start immediately. Uh, or or the, the typical requirement would be that it would be 30 days after the uh, certification of the election. Um, next would be publication costs. We discussed this at the last meeting. Um, right now, the, the uh, chapter nine requires two separate publications of the ordinance in the newspaper. And as the clerk explained, um, it ends up being very costly. I can't remember the numbers for the last election, Ashley. Mm -hmm. um, so November's election, because of how lengthy the ballot was and how many questions we had on there, uh, it was $16,000 each time. Um, and for this election with just the one, um, it's like $2,500 each time. So the, the proposal would be to eliminate one of the of the publications. There would still be protections and making people would still uh, have an opportunity to, to read the entire text on the city website, at the clerk's office, at the polling places. It just wouldn't um, get that second newspaper publication. Um, the the last uh, the last substantial change is the change in the in the five year rule that. The mayor discussed earlier, which would reduce right now. There's a, a provision that basically says any uh, citizen initiative um, can't be amended um, uh, for a period by the city council for a period of five years. Um, and the only way it can be amended is to go back through the citizen initiative process um, or or out back to a vote. Um, and uh, this proposal here is to allow an amendment after by the council after one year. Um, with a vote of six members of the council. Um, and uh, there's one uh, one part that I uh, that's in the in the revised uh, chapter nine, but it's not I, I don't think I mentioned it in the memo, which is to limit the the um, initiative process to the November, the the uh, regular November election um, and only have it uh, happen during that uh, election as opposed to the June election as well. So I think that sums it up. And I don't know, you know, how, how best to move forward if we want to sort of talk about those generally, talk about the substance of those generally, rather than get in the weeds, of, you know, the details, and we can sort of look at each section. Does that work for you? Well, I think first thing we'll do is take public comment. Okay. And then we'll head into the workshop portion of the evening. And um, I think people can speak specifically or generally. Um, but that was a great summary. Anything else before we move on? That is it from me. Okay, great. Thank you. So again, um, just to, um, as, as Michael was talking, I was thinking, okay, so, um, the, I believe that the, the signature requirement is something that looked to Maine state law to tie to that 10%. Um, I think that the fiscal impact statement also, um, is similar to what happens at the state Correct. level. And then the application procedure and review prior to obtaining signatures is kind of like the state revisor's office. We've talked about that um, in the past. Um, 
And uh, I know that the November, limiting it to the November ballot was something that came from a, from a counselor um, for inclusion. So there's things in here kind of generally that were put forward. There are things in here that come from staff um, some of the procedural stuff uh, I noticed in the in the draft that we include email, for example, whereas we didn't have uh, the term email used in the ordinance before. And I was going to ask you, Michael, do you recall the last time that this section of Chapter Nine was revised? Uh, to I rec I do not recall, but I can tell you. Um... I don't know which is it 91 yeah 90, I was going to say it's 1991, yeah, 1991 and it was originally enacted in the 50s okay yeah. so originally enacted in the 50s most recent revisions to this were from 1991 so great opportunity for us to have this iterative process to uh, review and see whether or not there's anything in this ordinance that could be um, improved upon. So with that, I will open it up for public comment. We don't have anybody here, here with us in chambers, but if you're on Zoom and you'd like to speak, go ahead and raise your hand. We're happy to have you here. The clerk will keep the, the clock at three minutes. Please give us your name um, and either your address or the organization you represent. And thanks again for being with us. Jim Hall, you can start us off. Hi, Jim Hall in District 1. Thanks. Uh, I appreciate you inviting public comment in your workshop. Uh, this is such a vital aspect of democratic checks and balances. Um, this part of ordinance really amounts to a hidden charter section, the way it impacts overall governance structure. Uh, that's why I advocate for requiring the same 30% turnout threshold. But um, the principal revisions you've asked uh, to draft here, you know, as the mayor went over the signature threshold, legal review, fiscal note, those all align with proven state level processes. And I support that on the same principle that we're implementing campaign, pun campaign funding to a proven state statute. Uh, you know, back in 91, I believe voters had to physically show up to city hall to sign a petition. Maybe that case, 1500 was seen as a groundswell of support, but uh, elections practices have changed radically uh, since this has been reviewed. You know, just see the reference to email in the cost saving section. Um, I fear the recent glut of very complex ordinance coming from a single interest group going straight to yes, no ultimatum proves our current law has become a loophole to bypass public processes in effect, propping up a non-elected shadow legislative body. And you may disagree with that, but in, in any case, we simply must set thresholds as percentages, at least fix that, especially with the present desire to grow housing stock and therefore total population. And please consider what mechanisms are available to ensure consensus building earlier in the process the way that poorly vetted cruise ship referendum was forced to ballot, even while its architects disavowed it, should be a cautionary tale. It's not hard to list others. Uh, currently, the only ways to improve are to adopt the stinker first, wait five years, or condemn a three-way alternative to no majority. I mean, why aren't we considering ranked choice? or uh, or even simple uh, plurality for the latter case. Um, I would say it may be worth discussing the differences between citizens initiative. Warning. Thank you, and people's veto. Um, the initiatives are basically crowdsourcing legislative powers, but currently without any of the consensus mechanisms like committee deep dives, workshopping, amendment, even sunshine laws, but veto, uh, provides a crucial check between campaign cycles were a future council to go rogue from its electors. The current thresholds and prohibitions conflate the two inappropriately. Uh, but whatever you propose in November, please ensure it can be digested as a holistic and integrated improvement on the ballot. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Next, we'll go to Eamon Dundon. Uh, Mayor Schneider and members of the City Council, good evening and thank you for hosting this workshop tonight. My name is Eamon Dundon and I'm the Director of Advocacy at the Portland Regional Chamber. 
Um, I appreciate this opportunity to address the need for modest reforms to Chapter 9 provisions concerning citizen-initiated referendums. Um, as was outlined by the mayor and Corporation Council, these reforms aim to align our process with the state of Maine's while also ensuring that our city council, you guys, as the legislative policy uh, making body of our city is empowered to effectively carry out its duties. Um, you know, we wholeheartedly acknowledge the vital role that referenda play in determining public sentiment on narrow yet important questions of public policy, such as gay marriage and the legalization of marijuana. However, in recent years, our city has been beset with increasingly broad and sweeping measures that amend and insert dozens of pages of city code without any impact from you, our elected policymakers. This inhibits your ability to respond to the needs of your constituents. Consider this scenario. If a concerned constituent were to approach you seeking improvements in the protections for workers provided by our minimum wage ordinance, you would be hindered by, from initiating the necessary actions to address their concerns due to the current prohibition on council amendments. Similarly, if an affordable housing developer were to request a waiver to provisions of the Green New Deal, citing excessive costs required by specific provisions in the ordinance, you would be prohibited from initiating council action directly undermining one of your most important goals, producing more affordable housing. Finally, I, I do want to bring to your attention a recent and urgent matter, and that is the First Circuit uh, decision in the case of We the People PAC v. Bellows. Um, in July of last year, the court ruled that Maine's constitutional prohibition on out-of-state signature gatherers is unconstitutional. Although this decision has not received significant media attention, its implications are far-reaching. It opens the floodgates for well-funded out-of-state organizations to effortless, effortlessly place misleading initiatives on our local ballot simply by virtue of their financial resources. This undermines the, the spirit of our existing ordinance, which aims to provide an outlet for groups of Portland residents to exercise their voice through hard work and grassroots organizing. It was not meant to enable the purchase of signatures to lock policies in city code for a minimum of five years. Uh, so in conclusion, we implore you to recognize the urgent need for reform. We must restore the balance between citizen initiatives and the authority and role of our elected officials. And by aligning our referendum process as closely to the state of Maine as possible, we can safeguard against unwarranted amendments to our city code by out-of-state organizations while ensuring that you, as our policymakers, can effectively fulfill your responsibilities. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Next, we'll go to Joshua. Mayor Snyder and counselors, my name is Joshua Chasen, uh, District 2, Sherman Street. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. I was excited to hear about this workshop because year after year, I feel like I'm binge voting on referendum after referendum. The ballot referendum process is designed to be used when voters feel as though city council is not governing to the best of their abilities and moving policies forward that voters want. The reality is, is that good policy takes time to craft. It requires input from vested interests, excuse me, vested interests, that policy that the policy was specifically would affect, which is not how ballot measures are written. They're often used as pol a political weapon in Portland because the perimeters to qualify are poor at best. While some initiatives proponents claim council isn't putting in the work, which is if, as, which is as offensive as it sounds. It requires a mere 1,500 signatures, with room for challenges, of course, to qualify for the ballot. It's my understanding that the number of signatures that are currently required was designed when folks actually had to go to the city clerk's office and physically walk in and sign the petition, which back then was a heavy lift. Once folks were allowed to take the petitions out into the community and no longer required folks to physically appear before the city clerk, that number of signatures didn't change. An increase in the number of signatures required is just good common sense and pragmatism surrounding the qualifications to get on a Portland city ballot. Mirroring our state guidelines as a percentage of voters is definitely needed and much more pragmatic. Our current chapter nine hamstrings city council and their ability to govern effectively by not allowing city council to amend or change bad policy that's often written without all the stakeholders present. Current rules prohibit any changes to initiative after its passage for five years. What's proposed would change that to one year, which is certainly much more common sense driven. Good governance by councilors that we vote into office is being tampered by an arcane rule that needs amending. And for, ultimately, by moving this legislation, the body, this body and council are supporting democracy 
just like signature gatherers proclaim to you, you supporting this is simply supporting it going before the voters. You're saying that you want voters to be able to decide if changes to chapter nine are needed. After hearing much of the testimony here today, it certainly warning. appears, thank you. It certainly appears that many voters would like the ability to change chapter nine. I, I do thank everyone for their time and consideration. Uh, and I applaud you folks moving this forward uh, and, and making our requirements mirror that of the states. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. Uh, we have been joined by Councillor Fournier. Welcome, Councillor. Good to see you. And we'll go now to Ken on public comment. Uh, which Ken? <laughs> Whichever Ken had his hand up. There's only one. There's only one. <laughs> Ken Capron, District 5. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of conversation uh, locally and around the state about making it harder to vote. And, and it, it definitely is a, a, an effort, an outright effort to find the easiest way to get people to vote and get, give them that right. But here we're taking away one of the major tools that, that voters have, uh, one of the limited tools that voters have to, to be heard by the, uh, by the council and, and, and by other Portland voters. Now, there may be a few things wrong with the rule, but uh, I, I'd recommend uh, a fewer signatures as necessary and, and, and other measures that, that make it easier when, when the councilors fail to do their job, which is listen to people and put forth uh, 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 ordinances and, and rules that, that really benefit uh, the city. When you fail to do your job, we need to have a way, an easy way to, to work around that, and that's through the uh, the initiative uh, process. So I, I, I see this as making the uh, effort even more difficult uh, as being the wrong direction, the wrong step. Granted, there needs to be a process under whichever, whatever hierarchy where the counselors and the petitioners sit down and have a conversation about what would be good, best language to serve both sides on the on the ballot that comes up, whether it's a June ballot or a November ballot, is irrelevant. But the fact remains that it, none of these initiatives would be necessary if the council and the counselors were doing their job, and that is to listen to your constituents. Council doesn't want to know where where or how it's failing is, is the impression that that this gives. The the Council needs to want or should want to hear what the electorate is is preferring, what they're demanding, what they're desiring. There needs to be uh, a, a uniqueness to Portland. Somebody mentioned about doing what the state does. I don't, as a Portlander, I don't give a damn what the state's doing. Let's do it our way. We're we're we have uh, home rule, so so let's let's do let's worry about us. And let the state do their thing, whatever they choose to do. But 1,500 votes or signatures is way too much. Thank you for the timing. Uh, is way too much. And I'd re recommend the only change that you really need is a way to, to collaboratively work on the wording of the ballot to get a meaningful question on the ballot. Everything else, make it easy. Because if your counselor is not doing the working for you, then you got to have another way, and it should be an easy way. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next, we'll go to Philip. Uh, good afternoon, counselors. This is Philip Matthew, Crosby Street, District 5. Um, my my concern about the, the changes presented is just that if taken en masse, this would sort of can be a, a very major change to the process by which petitions are used. As one of the people that um, has supported several of the recent referendum and has felt that they have sort of moved the ball forward in a meaningful way. I recognize that there's concern both from people that may not agree with some of those referendum, but also from counselors that would have preferred to put forth those changes to the ordinance from the council. I think the I support some of the things that have been proposed, especially the changes that would allow the clerk to help sort of ensure that uh, the referenda are, are as good as possible, for lack of a better word. Um, but I would 
did not want to limit the ability of sort of outside ideas to come into the council. The one other idea that I do not see expressly sort of presented in any of the proposed changes are changes to the process that would provide the council with more time to uh, craft and receive feedback on alternative ballot questions or anything of that form. To me, that kind of a modification to chapter nine would be more meaningful in terms of um, sort of providing a way for the council to both acknowledge a priority that's coming from the voters, from the residents of Portland, um, but also giving the council a chance to pursue through its own process some sort of alternative language. So um, I recognize that probably not everything that was presented is going to go through as a single motion, but those are my general thoughts on the overall uh, proposals. Thank you for your time. And thank you for your comment. Okay. I will now close public comment. Thank you to everybody who provided feedback. Again, we don't have anybody with us here in chambers, but we will move on into the workshop portion of our um, agenda this evening. I did want to just take a second, if I could, to um, offer a little bit of context. So I've been sitting in this seat since December of 2019. And since that time, we've had probably more citizen initiatives on ballots um, in just a couple of years than we've seen in a long time. So for me, this is actually response to constituent feedback over the last few years. Please have a look at this. Um, it's been 32 years since this ordinance was amended. So I think it's reasonable for us to say, is it working? Um, but again, this is iterative. You're gonna see things that are in front of you tonight that differed from March 27th. And we have the opportunity tonight to give Michael our feedback so that uh, what we see coming back before us can be reflective of changes that counselors would like to see. Um, I feel like this, I, for me, this feels like this is representative democracy at work. We're doing the work that we are here, uh, that we were elected to do. So wherever we land is gonna be a, res a result of nine people taking action. But I hope that we have the opportunity tonight to um, share thoughts and get ideas out on the table so that ultimately this council can have its say about whether or not chapter nine um, ought to have any amendments made or not. So I'll open it up for uh, discussion, questions, comments, general, specific. Any feedback on the draft you've got before you? Councilor Pelletier. Thank you. This is just general. We're just talking generally now, correct? Okay. I'm trying to, this is always awkward when this happens. Um, <laughs> so, I, I mean, I have some thoughts. I feel a little bit like a broken record, but I guess I'll share. Um, there we go. Um, this is going to sound a little sharper than I mean for it to. I haven't eaten today very much, so um, I don't mean it as intense as it's going to come out, but we are spending a significant time talking about something that wasn't a council goal. Um, so whether there were some post council meetings or conversations that must have happened, we have so many things that are happening in Portland right now, so many people feeling unsafe. So I'm definitely a little frustrated with how much time we're spending talking about uh, whether or not we need to amend the citizens initiative process. Um, so that's just like where I am in terms of a general vibe check. Uh, and, and then the second thing is another thing that I've, I've said a bunch of times now, which is I am not in favor of restructuring the process of the citizens initiative if we're not going to do what we say we always want to do in here, which is engage stakeholders and have the conversation with the stakeholders. So are there conversations with individuals or groups who have gathered signatures in the past and who have put forward referenda in the past? And is that something that we are going to do? And is that a next step? Um, before we actually make the decision on whether or not we are going to amend the signature count um, and whether or not we're gonna, you know, significantly change the, the citizens initiative process. I'm, I am definitely understanding that it hasn't been changed in several years. And so I'm I'm totally down to, to take a look and after we have these stakeholder conversations and see what we're able to do, but it's tough for me to feel like I can, especially, with the, the signature count, get on board with the amending of, of the signatures because 
I think, again, the reason that we're seeing a lot of citizens referenda come forward is there's something in here that people are not getting from us. And there's something that they are feeling frustrated by or unheard by or underrepresented by. And I, I think that speaks to not just us, but just local government in general. And I think that's that's the issue that I wish that we would talk about is how are we going to make sure that the people of Portland that we represent feel like we're hearing them, feel like we're listening to them, feel like we're collaborating with them because they clearly don't if they're putting forward referenda that is, you know, change that they're hoping that we make. And I know like that's another conversation, but again, like when I, when I wish we could have, um, and then the signature part is tough because you you need to get 300 signatures to qualify to be on the ballot to run for mayor in Portland or to be uh, an at-large city councilor. You need 75 signatures to qualify for the ballot to be a district councilor. So 15, which are not easy to get, but it's it's not like that's significant to me as well that you need less signatures to be to qualify for being the mayor of a city than you would for. Uh, a citizens referenda and both would have significant impacts to how the city is ran. So um, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's kind of where I am on, on this conversation. And I am going through the memo, which I really, um, Michael, I really appreciate the, the information from the memo that you gave us. And, oh, I did have a question in terms of the, the council can amend it if there is a citizens referendum that passes and the council can't amend it for five years. So there's no possible way that the, we would be able to amend something for five years. Is that correct? Uh, currently the, the council on its own cannot, it would have to go back out to the voters in order to do that. So it's through either the citizen initiative process or the, um, the council could put forward uh, an initiative to go out to the voters as well. So that, but the, the only way to change an ordinance passed through the initiative process is to go back out for another election. So we would have to create something. In that five-year period, sorry. Okay, yeah. so we would have to create something in here and then put that back out for another, for a vote, essentially. Right. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, like fiscal impact statement, I'm I'm good with that. I, I think that makes sense. I think the petitioners being main voters makes sense. Um, you know, I think the running it in the, sorry, I'm trying to find like where all of the bullet points are. Um, yeah, I, oh, the publication costs as well, um, eliminating the need for a second publication. I, you know, I, I don't know. I think I could go either way with that, but having it published once in the, in the newspaper and then Yeah, retaining the requirement that full text be posted at the clerk's office and at all polling pl places sounds fine as well. But the signature count um, is tough for me, and I don't I don't know that I can be in favor of raising the signature count if we're not addressing the the core issue. And to me, the core issue is that people don't feel like we are hearing them, and that's the conversation I I wish we would talk about. So I'm going to stop there. Thanks. Other counselors with any feedback. Councillor Phillips and then Councillor Zorro. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm just looking over the memo and I do have some concerns. I would agree with my um, fellow uh, councillor, um, Councillor Pelletier. I, I do have a little bit of a concern um, about um, the signatures um, and why it's 10%. And so in that, I do have a question. So um, how, many, how many signatures would we need um, if this was happening in November? Um, oh, the actual number? Yeah. I'm gonna, it's so it's, yeah, 10%, I'll defer to, uh, to Ashley on that one. Yep, it's, uh, so the 10% of the gubernatorial election was this past November was, uh, it would be 3,399. So almost doubled, and that would change every four years. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I, I, have, I have a little bit of a problem with that as well. Um, it just seems like a lot. I mean, and so I, I might be okay with a 5%, but I, I think doubling that amount seems, again, it's a little concerning to me. Um, 
And so that's it on the first one. Um, and then I'm okay with the uh, application procedure review, pro uh, let's say the signature, no, wait a minute, which one's this one? Proposed change to petition procedure provision of 9-36 C and D. I'm okay with that. Um, okay with the change in 9-36 E and D. Um, I do have some questions about the fiscal impact. I agree that there needs to be some fiscal impact uh, statement there. Um, I had a question about the 30 days in general. Um, why I don't, I maybe, maybe, I, maybe we could hear from the city manager, but to try and turn it, an ordinance around in 30 days seems like a lot of work. And so I'm not sure if we've given any recommendations or any suggestions or whatever to actually change that. Um, because again, I, 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 I'm, I will assume that there's a lot of work to try to change that within 30 days. So that'll be my first question. Um, the, yes, no. I think, oh, go ahead, Michael. I was gonna respond from a staff perspective, but go ahead. Well, I'll just say quickly, we, it, the general rule is that, that an ordinance after it's approved by the voters goes into effect 30 days after the final tally um, of the votes. Um, they can have retroactive uh, effect if the date is specified in the ordinance or prospective application as well. Um, and so, so that's that's where those that's where those numbers come from. But okay, so can I ask you a follow up? So when is the actual final tally? Typically a couple of days. So after. we're still talking. Right? Yeah, we're, it's we're about thirty days, and the, and from a staff perspective, that's been extremely difficult. Which is why we wanted to see um, a change to this provision specifically because um, we're already nine times out of 10 midway through a fiscal year. Uh, we haven't budgeted for these things. And then 30 days to turn around some of the more complex ordinances to get all the forms ready. Uh, it, it's, extreme, it's extremely difficult, um, which is why, uh, especially if you look at the rent control ordinance as an example, um, we didn't have staff in place to address that. So we had to prioritize and just address things based on the staff that we had because we couldn't add them mid-budget cycle. So um, it's become really complicated, which is why we've requested, or, or I had um, strong feelings about including at least a fiscal note. And then if the cost gets over 50,000 to say that we would delay implementation until the next fiscal year to be able to budget for that. Which I'm in, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in agreement with that. I'm trying to think about all the ones that are under fifty thousand. So I guess my next question is: is if this, if a lot of this is is um, was um, looked at because of the states, what the state was doing? Um, I, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, or maybe just ask the question: uh, when a bill gets passed in the state, how much time do they have to make it? No, not law or change something. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, not as sorry as I am. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, is it 90 days where after a bill gets well, it, it depends. I think sometimes yeah. they have emergency language in some of the bills, um, and then they do. It's usually, I think it is 90 days after the end of the um, legislative session that things go into place, but I'm not specifically sure with regard to referendums themselves. Yeah. Counselor, do you have an answer? Oh. I'm not corporation counsel. But I do have a comment about this when the chair is ready. Well, thanks. I've got some. Well, well, Councillor Phillips, you've got the floor. Next, we'll go if to. If you Councilor have the Zero. answer, I would love. If you if you think you have the answer, I'd love no, to hear. No, it. I want to stand. Down. I don't have the answer. Okay. All right. Sorry. Um, so my recommendation would be that that we would change that language as well, and maybe that's an addition. I am in full agreement with the um, that it would go into effect in the fiscal year, especially if it was um, over um, fifty thousand dollars. Um, I, um, as far as the publication costs, <clears throat> I miss things. <laughs> I miss things. I think we all miss things. So putting in the paper once, uh, it needs to go in the, if, if we could put it in the paper three times or four times, I know that's not what we're looking for, but we miss things. And so I, I'm not, I'm not in favor of that. I think we continue to do it twice. Um, because again, I think, uh, I think people miss things. Um, and, um, as far as the, um, now which one is this one? Oh, the uh, initiative process um, being able to, uh, um, it says initiative process anytime after one year after the effective date of the ordinance. When is the effective date of the ordinance? Is that, does it vary? It, it'll vary depending on the things I mentioned earlier, which is 
the, the sort of general rule that's in the in chapter nine already existing in there, and it's not one of the not one of the areas that I recommended changing, but certainly happy to change it. Right. General rule is thirty days, but the, the the language of the ordinance can have prospective or uh, or retroactive uh, effect. So um, my concern about that one is is that if we have an if we have a, a, a citizens initiative, it passes. Who knows about the 30, 60, 90 day thing? And then the fiscal note doesn't start until July. Then we have, it's, I don't know when it would be in, like, when would it be in effect? Because it could change that November or that January. And so it's only been, the citizens initiative has only been enacted for six months. You see what I'm saying? Or am I sounding confusing? I, I, I'm not totally clear of the question. So, sorry. <clears throat> My concern is, let's just, let's just say, um, the effective date is January 1st, for lack of a better word. Um, and um, oh, no, wait, let me separate. Let's say the effective date is July 1st, right? That's with the fiscal note. Right now I'm confusing myself. <laughs> Let's see, I'm trying to figure this out. If the effective date is January 1st, but because it's over 50,000, it doesn't go into effect until July 1st then when would it be changed if it would only be for a year? Would it be changed in January of 20, wait a minute, of January, or would it be changed a year from July? The, I think I got it. And I, and I, I think it? I think I got it. Oh, Jesus, thank you. Whew, child, sorry. Right, right now, as, 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 it's, uh, as the language is drafted in the, in the version that was attached to the memo, it would be the, the, the one year period is tied to the effective date of, of the ordinance. Right. And so it, if I think the way the, the process would work as proposed is if there is a greater than $50,000 mm -hmm. fiscal impact, then automatically the effective date would be July 1. Right. And that means that the time, that one year time period would, would start July 1. Okay. It just seems too little for me. I mean, I'm looking at it. I'm looking at, I'm looking at the ordinance and all the work that has to go in to somebody actually putting together a citizen initiative, and then it passes. Right? They go through all. They get the signatures. They do a committee according to this. There's a committee, um, and it finally passes. And then a year later, then we get to we get to change that. So, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say I looked up um, about when they go into effect for the state. And it is regularly 30 days unless it involves the expenditure of funds. And so if it does involve the expenditure of funds, it's held off for 45 days until the convening of the next legislature so that they can provide a means uh, to raise the revenue um, to be able to cover that cost. So they, they do anticipate expenditures and, and so on as well. So again, I would make some kind of a recommendation um, that um, it not just be the 30 days, that we, we consider that as well. Um, because it is difficult to put all that together. Um, anyway, I, I've said enough, um, and um, those are my concerns, I guess, and my questions. I may have more. Thank you. And just quickly respond, if I can, of course, to that to that last comment, which is, we would uh, we would when we did when we do the fiscal impact um, statement, that'll be that would be at the beginning of the process before the petitions get circulated, and if 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 the finance uh, department notifies us that the fiscal impact is gonna be greater than 50,000, then we would, um, we would then put in the prospective July 1 uh, effective date into, into, the, uh, into the draft ordinance that would be included in the petition. Does that make sense? It, it does make okay. sense. I, okay. uh, my concern is, is if we only give it a year, if the city council goes from us not being able to do anything for five years to one year, with that fiscal note, I don't know how long, I mean, it's only a year. So my concern is it's just not enough time, especially if, like Councilor Pelletier said, there's a lot of time and a lot of energy that is spent trying to put something together, right? Especially when you look at the whole ordinance of you need nine signatures just to, just to bring it forward. And then the process of, getting all of the signatures, especially if we raise the amount of the signatures, that's a long, that's a long process for somebody um, who has, uh, you know, the energy to, to change, uh, to change something. And for us to say it's only going to go into effect for a year just seems really, um, it just seems too little for me. And so I would, uh, I don't know about others, but I would like to increase that one year to something different. I don't know at this point in time what that would be. 
Well, and Councillor, that's exactly what we're here for because what's on paper in front of you tonight is kind of a starting place. So that's exactly the kind of feedback I'm listening for. Um, I think I just one point of um, context within what you were talking about. Um, when does when is the legislature able to amend a citizen referendum at the state level? Do you know that answer? Okay, that might be interesting just for us to learn. I actually think it may be um, relatively immediately because I do recall with some of the marijuana legislation that there were issues, but I'd have to look it up okay. um, or defer to Michael on when that specifically could happen. Um, one thing I wanted to just clarify, Michael. So if we delayed the implementation due to over 50,000 fiscal impact to uh, July 1st, that would the year clock that Councillor um, Phillips was just talking about would be from that July 1 to the following July 1. Is that correct? That, as it's currently drafted, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it would give a year, but it would start when that July 1 date hit. Right. But technically within that year, would the city, if this were to go through, Technically, within that year, we could say we don't want it anymore and vote it out. Correct? No, Not, it, it wouldn't. Vote it, out, but. it wouldn't be. Let, let's say there's a, you know, a, uh, an election on November of twenty three. Yep. Um, and there's an initiative that has well, that's too soon. But anyway, for example, just for example purposes. Yeah. Um, if there was a uh, an initiative that had a greater than fifty thousand dollar fiscal impact, it would go in effect. July 1 of 24. Yep. It would not be you would not be able to amend it until July 1 of 25. That's correct. So, so it, it would only be in effect for a year. That's right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. It, it, right. We would be able to change it within a year, but we don't have to change it. No, 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 I'm saying for all of that work, right? For all of that work and then finally getting it into the budget. It would only be in the budget for a year because we would have we could change it within a year. Uh-oh. You could. Yeah. After that year. That's right. As of yes. Right. Yeah. So again, date is malleable. This is just yeah. Thank you. Um, Councillor Zaro. I have a general comment on the proposal. That's all. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think I'm going to take a step back. Um, I'm recalling the last workshop we had on it and we had a diversity of perspective. And I mean, that's the best part of this work that we can all come at it and be like, I like this, I don't like that. And then get in there and, and work it together as a body to make a recommendation, which I think is inherently what the referenda process removes us from doing, um, even though it has a really important role. Um, I think that there needs to be some balance um, and that's what this conversation for me is. And I, I'm not particularly tied to an outcome right now. I'm actually genuinely um, eager to work with all of you on, on getting to that and finding what that balance is. But what I do know is that if it's made, if it's made easier to uh, have a referenda on the ballot, then it needs to be made easier to fix it when issues come up and when things go awry, which we've seen happen before unintentionally. Um, Right now, it is not difficult to get a referenda on the ballot, but it is extremely difficult and inherently challenging for us to fix that when something needs some attention. Um, so that's the lens I'm looking at it when I'm coming here. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to be flexible. And I really appreciate what both of you shared in your perspective. Um, Councillor Phillips kind of talking about, okay, you're not comfortable with the 10%. That's fine, but being open to 5% or 8% or something that's different. I think that's, you know, I'm, I'm open to that conversation as well. The idea of, well, if the threshold is gonna double, do we provide more time to get the, you know, being okay with that. Um, you said something that, you know, talking about the window just before the time frame. it's a long process. And if it's such a long and, and, and you know, challenging process, the effects of what would happen if only a year it gets turned around. And I mean, I think the, my reaction to that was, and I wrote it down was, you know, this is, it's a serious endeavor for folks to want to, you know, put their fingerprints on, on ordinance to, ch to change it by referenda. And 
Councilor Pelletier, you're totally right. It's our job to be there to, to do a good job, especially as district councilors um, and represent our constituents. But, you know, not everyone's going to be great at that all the time. Like, you know, we're, we're always ultimately going to uh, need, we, we always could do more. And I, I recognize that having done this for a few years. Um, so for me, all of that to say, <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'll just, I'll let you know my general uh, where I'm coming from. I, I appreciate and, and support a November only uh, so that we just are getting a better turnout for folks. We know in June, that's not the case. I'm supportive right now of, of a 10, per, uh, you know, aligning with the state for 10% of the voters in the last gubernatorial election, but immovable. Uh, if need be, if we can find a compromise. I know a few weeks ago with clean elections, we were diligent to align with the state. And so um, I feel like that's in line with it. Um, the administrative circulation of petitions, uh, that's, that makes sense to me. Uh, the fiscal impact statement, I understand. We've, we've seen that a little bit more and more lately. I'm in alignment with Councillor Phillips about the publication costs, just thinking about you know, my constituents in D4, they read the paper, they might miss it the first time, although I know it has an additional cost. Um, and the one thing that I wanted to point out and loop back on, and I think um, Councilor Rodriguez and I discussed this in the last workshop was kind of that super majority of the council amending. Um, I noticed in the packet, I missed it. It was six out of nine. I think we talked to seven out of nine and the rationale was, because that's what's required to waive a second reading and pass something as an emergency. So I just feel like that would be in alignment with our already existing rules. Um, the last thing that I would wanna name is to make sure that we are explicitly outlining our authority as a council and a body to amend the title and summary language, which I know we've done before, but it's always a little bit ambiguous when we, when we have to do that. Um, I just wanna be really clear about that. Um, if, if we do move forward with this, because this is obviously our, our opportunity um, to do that. So I think those are all my notes uh, at the moment. But either way, regardless of how this goes, I really appreciate the conversation. I'm happy we're having it uh, because it's honestly one of the most consistent things that I hear from, from District 4 cons, uh, constituents. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Dion, and then Councillor Pelletier, and then Councillor Rodriguez. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I want to begin with this notion that direct democracy arises from some assumption that we're not doing our job. I reject that. Um, when I see a citizen's initiative, I don't question the motive. I don't see it as designed to somehow be a response to an elected body's inability or unwillingness to address a particular issue. I think citizens are more sophisticated than that. I think they can decide for themselves if there's a question that they feel so passionate about that they want to present to the elected population as a whole. And it's not a comment on a council or a commission or a legislature. So I, I don't dwell on that very much like, oh my God, there's an initiative because somehow I didn't meet my expectations as a representative in this body. I don't do that. Um, what I am concerned with is, is there clarity around language, all right? Whatever the referendum question looks like, I wanna ensure a process where there's clarity around language so we all know what's intended by the content of the proposed question. Um, so I, at the same time, I don't spend a whole lot of time worried about how many signatures. I, last time I ran for something of substance, I had to gather 2,000 signatures. Let me tell you, that's a lot of work. You know, my hat goes off to people that take on that responsibility. So the signature is not important to me as the clarity of the question. After the clarity of the question, I'm concerned about the capacity to inform the electorate or the electors, I should say, citizens of the ballot. What is the cost of this question? I think it's incumbent that to have a fully informed decision about a particular ballot question, you need to know what it costs. Um, it may have some, some use to some voters and little no use to others. I mean, I, you always read the uh, highway bond questions, a lot of numbers there, um, but I do pay attention to the numbers that are being 
fancied about inside that because a bond is simply a credit card decision by the government. So I think we need to do the same thing. I think the public needs to know, yes, I support this in principle, but when I saw the price tag, I moved along to some other selection in the aisle, all right? So that's incumbent for us to do that. Uh, the next piece is something I have heard a lot from many residents um, in the community is this notion of being able to amend a referendum that has passed. That's that delicate dance between direct democracy and representative democracy. Um, I worked on the marijuana question. We thought we had it down pat. There were many lawyers on that team, many very smart non-lawyer people as well. And um, it only took us five years to unravel the knots that we thought didn't even exist. Five years. And the legislature began work on it immediately because there was some apparent conflict of laws that existed in our proposal. What the legislature understood as we would when a referendum is passed is that the public has spoken about their intent, about a direction we should be going into, but I don't think any of them are so married to particular language is that they would walk into this chamber and oppose us making some modifications. Um, so I'm not particularly keen on having this year waiting period. There might be something that is brought to our attention very early on in the life of that new ordinance that presents a problem as it tries to marry itself to the rest of ordinances. Corporation Council might bring us to that attention. I think the public interest is protected by a supermajority. We can take his advice or not. And if we feel there has to be some manner of immediate intervention, then it would be up to six or seven of us. I would lean on six uh, to take some action. So uh, that's a big piece. So the cost of an initiative, the clarity of the language, um, a fiscal note, I'd leave alone um, the issue of signatures. Privately, I could, I could want more but what am I accomplishing by that? I never have a good answer for myself. So that's why I'm directed to try to leave that alone if those other things are met. And in terms of fiscal uh, consistency, I like the idea that if it has a certain threshold, that that has to be moved forward so that this council through its own budget process can incorporate that cost. And that's where we get to make decisions that, Okay, the public wants X, here's the cost that we thought it was gonna be and what's the trade off in our own internal decision about the municipal health, the fiscal health of this municipality. So those are the general things that I think about. So I do, I think I have some flexibility here in my understanding, but I think it is an important piece uh, to address moving forward, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dion. Um, next, back to Councillor Pelletier. Thank you, just really quick question. Um, were we talking about when, okay, I wanna understand, I guess the process from here is, are we, we're not voting on this today? Or no, this are is we? a workshop. Okay, but would this, this would be something that we would need to vote on? It would be a two read item. So okay. my intention would be that we would see it on a June agenda okay. for a first read. That would give us time before we would then see it as a, for a second read. Um, so amendments could be prepared, but we can give feedback tonight. We could give uh, prepared amendments between a first read and a second read. There can be amendments that come from the floor. And then we're not, did we determine that we would be, since part of this wording is it would only be November, I think. Are we talking about November of this year that we would be putting this forward to the voters? Or did we determine a date of when we would want to put this forward? Are you go ahead, I because I don't know the answer to that question. That it would be on on the ballot this, I think this November. It, I think it would take. It would, I think it would like any other ordinance change. It would take effect thirty days from council action. Uh, so I guess this, the reason I'm hesitating is because I don't know how many days between council action and the November ballot there would be, and there's dates in Chapter Nine that people would need to look at. The well, amendments to Chapter Nine, by their very nature, have to go onto the ballot. 
Right. Because right. So and so maybe I'm misunderstanding. Councillor Pelletier, are you saying would would getting citizen initiatives on the November ballot be bound by ordinance changes? Uh, oh. This is just getting it on the ballot in November. <laughs> this no, is, sorry, I got confused too. This is, the, the council's action would be to put the question on the November ballot. Of this year? Correct. Okay. And we decided, we decided that in here, or is that something else that we would have to vote on, I guess, is my question. Am I making sense? I think, I think the council action would be to send it to the ballot. Right. Right. There would be uh, there would be two reads it would, and a vote by this council to approve it, um, and then um, and then it would be prepared to go onto the onto the ballot like like another you know any initiative or referendum. Yeah. Okay. Do you remember? So it would last be on the yeah. The, the, it would be. I think the plan right now, if the council approves, it would be to get um, to have the changes to chapter nine on the November ballot for the voters. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I made that more confusing. I think that last year, for example, we scheduled a special meeting at the end of August because we had some things that needed to get on the ballot and we need to make sure we do that in time for the clerk to set the ballot and order the ballot. We did that. And I think we've done that every year. So, um, so there are things um, that may, so for example, the gender neutral language that we talked about, that is something we need to get on the November ballot. So we've got to schedule the first and second read. In my view, I don't know why we wait until August to do these things if we know they're coming. So that gives everybody a little more time and information to have um, uh, rather than you know always pushing it up against the deadline, which again is what we've done the last couple of years, special meetings in August. So uh, my hope would be with anything that we know that there's interest in getting on the ballot in November, we can do that without um, a special meeting. Okay, over to you, Councilor Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess I just want to start. I guess start by saying that I I don't disagree with anything that has been said so far. Um, and I I like Councilor Zaro's framing of um, approaching the work in, in a way to bring balance. I think that that I can see it that way as well. So um, if I go down the um, recommendations and sort of kind of speak to them, um, I'll try to be um, direct. Um, on the uh, on the changes of uh, number of signatures, I'm comfortable with the 10% of the last gubernatorial election. I uh, appreciate the clerk's involvement uh, reviewing uh, ordinance summaries and title compliance, so like that. On the circulation of petitions, I was actually um, hoping I would like it to be, instead of uh, registered main voters, um, I'd like it to just be um, uh, main residents. I think um, I view, you know, I've, I've talked before about my my views of political participation happens in very many different ways. And you could potentially have somebody who is, um, you know, not eligible to vote, um, but wants to participate politically and circulating petitions, um, participating in other um, opportunities to be uh, involved in a political um, system. I think it's I want to I want to create those opportunities. So um, having this be limited to main residents is something that I would prefer over just voters. Um, I obviously I like the fiscal impact um, piece, and I do uh, like the if it the notion of if it's <clears throat> more than fifty thousand dollars, the moving the the in the day of um, uh, well, I guess when it goes in effect to July, that makes sense. Um, I agree with Councillor Phillips about the publication piece. I, I, I would like us to stick to the two um, uh, newspaper um, publish, uh, publications or two times a second publication. Um, and on the, on the uh, being able to amend an ordinance that's been passed, um, I, I would like to, like I said last time, um, have that seven vote um, requirement instead of six. Um, and same thing, I think the way that Councilor Saro framed it, that that's what's required to pass something as an emergency. I, I think I, I can see those two things um, similarly weighed. Um, so seven votes would be my preference. And I think that's the end of the list. All right, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Trevorrow. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Did you have a hand up? Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I want to say, first of all, that I appreciate um, the work that has gone into this. And um, I want to just let people know that I never question intentions. I, I think that um, the reason that this is before us comes from the, the best intentions. Um, and I say that because I feel like my comments on this issue can kind of land as personal. Um, that's not the intent. It's simply that when it comes to issues of democracy and access to democracy and the question of limiting versus expanding access to democracy, I just hold very kind of black and white principles. Um, so I think that probably the reason this hasn't been visited in 35 years I, I grew up in Maine, which is a referendum state. And I think that the voters of Maine hold the referendum process as sacred. It's a check on the balances of democracy that we're accustomed to here. And I think even though here locally, it's written in ordinance rather than the charter, at the state level, it is in the state constitution. So it has the feel of a constitutional issue um, and the gravity that comes with that of, of holding it as impermeable. Um, so my two cents on, on this, there's very little in it that I would be willing to support. <laughs> um, the, and I, I think I went over my reasons why at our last um, workshop. So. I don't feel like I need to reiterate them again. I guess I can tell you the parts that I um, would be interested in are simply the five-year um, provision whereby currently we can't touch it for five years. I would be interested in some kind of language that allowed us to amend but not repeal within five years and perhaps by a supermajority I would like to see if we could craft some language that allowed us to um, speak to kind of the substance of what we're changing. Um, but I understand that that, uh, that gets tricky with legal language. Um, and so if we can do it by a super majority, I think that that kind of gets at the same issue. So um, to me, that is the, the major issue that um, the public is, is speaking to with regard to chapter nine. Um, so that's really kind of the, the biggest thing that I would consider supporting. Other than that, um, simply kind of the benign administrative changes like the advertisement in the paper. Um, and I would be interested in seeing it go to a November ballot specifically. So. Um, but I, I mean, I understand I may be a minority on this issue. I'm willing to be a uh, vote against and it'll go to the November ballot and we can see where the voters land. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Fournier. Oh, Councillor Rodriguez. Yeah, I'm sorry. I forgot one piece on the uh, amending the ordinance has been passed. Um, I just want to be really clear. Um, so if let's say an ordinance a citizens initiative passes uh, in a November ballot. Um, I understand that we cannot vote uh, to make a change until a year after the effective date, but we can begin deliberation on work to create that motion or create that work almost right away. So like the meeting right after the November referendum passes, we can queue it up to a committee to start amending something even though the vote to actually amend it doesn't happen until a year after it's been. I just wanna, yeah. because that- There's nothing, I mean, there's nothing in the, there's nothing that would prevent that. Okay. Yeah. So to that end, um, I, I, I guess I'll start, I'll start at the end. Um, I'd like it instead of a year um, for us to consider 18 months. Um, that seems sort of kind of, <laughs> well, anyways. Um, so I, um, I think that it would take, I think a council, and I've said this at our last workshop, I think a, a council would be, I certainly would be um, very, um, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't 
go into amending something that passed the referendum without being very thoughtful and, and being very deliberate about it. I don't know that councils would be very aggressive using that um, this leverage that we're putting here. Um, again, because because I think there is this fundamental respect for what, what happens at, at the ballot. Um, and, I, and I hope also, and this is, I don't think that we can uh, put in an ordinance what a substantive change would be. But my, my hope is that changes would be limited to, um, to not something that would completely eliminate the, the, the initiative, but to, to be less than substantive. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, that I'm, and I don't think that that would probably be um, possible to have an ordinance that, that gives some sort of guidance and um, what is a substantive change or not. But anyways, um, 18 months uh, is the piece that I do wanna leave us uh, with on uh, my recommendation on that piece, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fournier. Oh, go ahead. Can I just quickly, um, I, I wanted to quickly respond to something Councillor Rodriguez said previously, um, and I just wanted to check it before I before I responded, but um, on the, circul the, the petition circulators have to be, state law requires that they be uh, main voters. So that's required. And then people who sign uh, the petitions have to be, Voters and registered in the in the municipality. So, I just wanted to make sure that to, to clarify that issue. Okay, thank you. I am okay. obviously I wasn't aware of that. Uh, yeah. I guess so. We, we don't have a choice then. Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you, Councillor Fournier. Okay. Anybody else first? <laughs> I really appreciate. Thank you. I forgot to say thank you. Really, thank you. For I just have to give you a hard time. Um, I, I think I'll echo a lot of what my colleagues have said here. Um, I think we are striving for a balance because we want the public to be engaged, I would much rather have them be engaged as we're working things through committee, as we have a chance to have a back and forth dialogue. And I you know, have heard from the public when they've been here that they sometimes don't feel like there is an opportunity for back and forth dialogue. So to uh, Councillor Pelletier's point, I think figuring out how, how do we address that? And I don't think there will ever be a perfect solution, but we always have room for improvement. And so I definitely, don't want to do so much that we're removing the ability for the public to engage with us. I would much, again, prefer that it be before we have to take um, lots of extra steps to be able uh, to have that collaboration. Um, to that end, um, I'm just gonna, as my colleagues did, just kind of go through the different points to share where I'm at. Um, as far as the um, petition signature requirement, um, I'm still fine with 1500. <clears throat> and my reason for that is, whatever is put forward in referendum still has to go in front of voters. And so ultimately this is all going back to our public and our public has to make this decision. So we can't just get these 1500 signatures and say, great, we're gonna pass it as a council. It has to go to voters. And so I'm, I'm comfortable with the 1500. I think as Councillor Zaro had mentioned, finding the balance of if we are going to get a referendum to us and we're going to, um, put that out to the voters, I wanna make sure what's going out to the voters is accurate, that we both as a governing body and as the public understand the cost of what that's going um, to be um, to implement because I don't think either side wants to do harm. I think we're really truly all trying to do what's best for the city of Portland, but having sat on both the referendum side and being very much in support of questions that are coming up and now sitting on the elected side, I can see this is really complicated. And so it is very important, I think, that we have as much information as possible for voters so that they know what they're voting for. So to make that language clear, um, I think is very important. Um, so I, I'm fine with the 1500. Um, as far as the review, I really appreciate the review from the clerk uh, and Corporation Council before these petitions get out to voters. So I am in support of that. Um, the circulation of petitions matching the state language, I'm okay with that. Um, the fiscal impact statement, I think for me is one of the more important components of what we're sharing, because I do think it's important to understand, are we putting forward a measure that is a $50 impact or a $500,000 impact? Uh, and I think those are very different things. And as we saw with the budget this year, there's not a lot of wiggle room. And so if we're passing something that we can't change um, or that we, we don't wanna change, it's the, what the public wants. I'd rather have um, a greater understanding of that out at the outset. Um, I do also agree with uh, Councillor Phillips, I miss things. <laughs> 
Um, we have work, we have counsel, we have families, we have life outside of uh, this room. And so understanding that our public also is probably very similarly um, situated. So making sure that there is a second publication or an additional way for people to see that information, I think is very important. Um, and then the final, um, being able to do an amendment. Um, I think I'm more along the lines of over a year. So whether it's 18 months or two years, um, and I would rather see it making an amendment rather than revoking uh, or rescinding whatever's been um, passed would be where I'm at. So those are my, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Appreciate that. Councillor Ali. Uh, thank you, Mayo. Uh, and then I think uh, I mostly agree with, um, I'm just gonna point out things that I think uh, I will be comfortable with. Um, I think uh, um, making participation available to um, our residents uh, means uh, a lot to me, but uh, to quote some of my colleagues, uh, we need to have a balance. So I wouldn't mind keeping the signatures at uh, 1,500, but uh, um, in order to have a balance, because sometimes you cannot measure, if you remember, I think it's, there is uh, the Green New Deal. Uh, we have developers saying that the cause of the reason that why we cannot build in Portland is because of the Green New Deal. And then we have our own staff saying that we haven't collected enough data to agree with what the developers are saying. Um, I remember at a housing committee meeting several times, I have a staff saying to me that councillor, uh, we cannot say that the reason why uh, developers are not building in Portland is because of the Green New Deal because we don't have enough data to support that this thing. So I will say, let's put the time frame where council can deliberate and possibly uh, amend um, an ordinance or uh, something that I have passed by citizens to two years. That gives enough um, room. Um, I'm just using um, the, the Green New Deal as an example, because it's been more than almost two years now, but still staff may say that we don't have enough data. So I want to give staff enough data to support the work, um, uh, staff the space to collect enough data and then I know that the council can do whatever we want uh, within the frame of law. We cannot just do whatever we want, but there are things that we can do uh, because we are the body that make policies. But two years will be, for me, uh, will be much, much more better than a year or eight months, that six months different or four months different can make a different in data collection. Uh, what else? Yeah, I was going to, make a case about the uh, non-residents and registered voters, but I think Councillor Councillor Riggs tried that and it didn't work, so I'm not even going to go there. Yeah, I agree with uh, everything else, um, yeah. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. So I'll weigh in. I just, I just want to start by saying that whether one person requests a workshop or multiple people do, we always do our best to get it on the schedule. So um, again, I don't wanna go back to why we're here tonight, but it um, certainly was at the request of counselors who were following up and, and, and wanting to have this. So I appreciate everybody's input tonight. Um, and I will also say that um, I tried to stay away from the specifics of the first draft we saw on March 27th. Um, and and um, and went back and forth with Michael about the responses we got from counselors on March 27th in order to have work product for tonight. But for me, I come into this with an open mind. I think that, um, like I said, over the past three years, I have had significant constituent feedback asking for review. Um, but where we land, I really want it to be the product of this council. And um, it, in the spirit of, representative democracy. We've got an, an old ordinance. We've had a lot of action in this realm. We've had a lot of feedback. Do we need to make any changes? That's really up to us. Um, and I, I certainly think that having um, public comment at workshops, um, both of them, um, was important. It's, it's what I wanted to do. We don't usually have public comment during workshops, but I think that this is an important one. Um, 
So I, that, that's where I am. Um, so what you're seeing before you tonight is not my work product. This is the culmination of um, our uh, process as a council. Um, as far as the signature requirement goes, I think that I look back to um, you know where this was, 1,500 signatures was in 1991 when people did have to come into City Hall to sign petitions. Um, so I think I'm op open-minded to change there. I'm not committed to it. I hear a majority of the councilors saying they're fine with 1,500, it's fine with me. Um, I hear a lot of support for the administrative changes that have been made with regard to the application procedure prior to obtaining signatures and the circulation of petitions. Um, that works for me too. I am definitely in support of a fiscal impact statement and I hear my council colleagues are as well. Um, I think it's smart actually, because I, again, in 2020, it was very difficult to watch staff try to implement five new ordinance changes without the funding to do it. And so it ends up being frustrating for everybody. The folks who put the question on the ballot who wanna see the change, the voters who voted for that change um, and, and staff who kind of have their hands tied and that doesn't work for anybody. So I think that's smart. I'm hearing people wanna stick with two publications. Um, it's fine with me. And then as far as the um, council's ability to amend an ordinance enacted through the initiative process, um, I'm open-minded there as well. I've, I've heard support for 12 months. I've heard support for 18 months. I've heard support for two years. So I think we can figure out a way to get there together. I will say that um, on a practical level, uh, when the voters have spoken, in my view, you have to be really, really careful about what you would potentially do to change anything. The voters have spoken, and I think that we all have a ton of respect for that. So I think what I've learned over the last three years is the the possibility for amend amendment wouldn't be substantive, it would be administrative. Is there anything in an ordinance that um, would require administrative? Um, but I actually think that, that the application procedure and review um, element gets at that. I think we'll have improvement as a result of that kind of revisor's capacity that we're talking about building in. So that makes me feel um, like there is, uh, there's improvement in that way. So um, I just, and, I, and I'm fine um, whether we go with um, two thirds council needing to act on that front or a super majority. I'm, I'm flexible and open-minded there. I think for me, what this is, is I, I have full respect for the citizen initiative process. I think it's part of our state government. I think it's part of our local government. It's here to stay. I think for me, what this is, is it's a common sense review of of, of an ordinance um, that we've been asked to look at. So I'm happy to look at it and I appreciate everybody's feedback. Um, and I think we can get something before you that represents the feedback and we can take it from there like we would with any other um, ordinance amendment. And again, the account, sorry to have gotten things confused in response to Councillor Pelletier. This, this, is council, this would be council action contemplating a question that would ultimately be decided by voters. Did you have something you wanted to say? Michael, anything? Anything else from council colleagues, Councillor Phillips? I just wanna add something. I really do want us to look at and see the next time we're together if we can make some kind of recommendations to change the 30 days to a 45 day. If it's under 50,000, isn't that what you said, city manager? If you're trying to track the state, the, the constitution says 30 days, but if there's money involved it was 45 days plus the le going to the legislature so right, but the, sure. it, there's no it, it doesn't say how much money because in our ordinance it would say over fifty thousand dollars so i'm saying i did under fifty thousand dollars i would it would i don't know what i mean i certainly don't want to debate it tonight but um that would be a recommendation i would like to make is the 45 days instead of the 30 for under fifty thousand. and then can i say something else and <laughs> councillor phillips just to clarify there is that within the citizen initiative process, um, a citizen initiated amendment to an ordinance, you're saying you'd be more comfortable with a 45 day implementation period, but are you talking about ordinance amendments in general? Because the council rule or are, are any ordinance amended by the council goes into effect 30 days. Why that is a very good question. We can think about it. That's in the, yeah, that's in the charter. Oh, so oh, the that's 30, in the yeah. charter. Okay. 
Okay, so I cater that one. Oh. Um, but I do have another question that doesn't have anything to do with this. It gets back to um, uh, Councilor Pelletier's comments at the beginning of, of here and something that you had just said, which is, is that tonight we had this uh, work session and we opened it up to public comment, which, which we don't normally do. And so for me, in order for us to actually have um, engagement, um, I don't know if it's an ordinance, but I would like us at some point in time to talk about how that would be if that's changing something in our ordinance to say that we would have public comment on our work at our workshops or every workshop. Um, I, I just think that that might be an easy way to get more engagement from the public um, if we were able to do public comment in all of our workshops. That's it. I'm done. Okay. Thank you for that feedback. Appreciate it. Okay, I think, thank you everybody. Um, this was uh, relatively brief. So this workshop is adjourned and have a good night.